This is a group commonly referred to as the Stellenbosch Mafia, a concept as polarizing as the immense wealth it represents. It's a Stellenbosch story, a town that embodies not only its charming history but also the shadows cast by an exclusive group, a modern day aristocracy with hands firmly gripping on the controlling reins of South Africa's destiny. This is where it all started. Uh, yes, uh, the epitome of uh, white monopoly capital, uh, the Stellenbosch Mafia. Johan Rupert, South Africa's richest man, is interviewed on Power FM. The interview was an attempt to wrest control of a narrative that had morphed into accusations of puppeteering, accusations that dubbed him the godfather of the Stellenbosch Mafia. So somebody says to you, white monopoly capital, what does that do to you, or Stellenbosch Mafia? Well, I ask you, what does it mean? So yes, I'm white, and yes, I believe in the free enterprise system. As for the monopolist, I don't know where they get that. This Power FM interview was meant to clear Rupert's name. Well, as it turns out, he doesn't like being referred to as the godfather of the Stellenbosch Mafia. It didn't go exactly as planned though. With Rupert throwing outdated racial epithets, Rupert's attempt to dismantle this notion of a modern day Hoggenheimer, a caricature of a Jewish capitalist from the past, all went south. Sitting here and listening to the conversation myself, I feel like, am I, am I in the wrong place? Am I in the wrong room? And I hear, you know, laughter and affirmation for some of the things that you are saying. It's, to me, a classic case of cognitive dissonance. You're in a context in which you converse in the way that you do. You're obviously comfortable at doing that, which is why you're doing that here this evening. But I want to just send you a signal, a signal from the outside. How do you breach that divide or that sentiments amongst a lot of people who are listening that you're out of touch a little bit with how South Africans will be receiving your message, which comes across as... In, 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 and I'm, used, I'm, I'm hearing the word racist. Some people saw Rupert's words as a manifestation of ignorance and privilege. The accusations flew thick and fast. Racism, cognitive dissonance and a failure to recognize privilege. The aftermath of the interview revealed significant divisions in society where Rupert became a symbol of racial prevalence in a landscape marked by a collective black disadvantage. You know, it's very common for people to have this preconceived and often prejudiced view of the wealthy. I mean, it is pretty common to scrutinize wealth, right? Who has it? How do they acquire it? And what do they do with it? But this is not your typical prejudiced story about the rich elite. Let me show you how a group of people from a small town in the Western Cape control an entire country. Is white monopoly capital even a reality? You don't believe in white monopoly capital, you don't live in South Africa. There's no science to that statement, I'm afraid. That controls science. There is no science to that statement, I'm saying produce the evidence. One of the companies, well-known companies in the country, one company owns more than 75% of the shares quoted in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. This is illustrative of how our economy is organized. It is more the, the, the resources of the country are monopolized by a white minority, even in that minority by a few individuals, whereas the masses of the people, especially blacks, are left poor, ridden with disease, illiteracy, without educational facilities. We wanted to develop an economy which will put an end to that. There's no clarity on exactly where the phrase Stellenbosch Mafia originated. This phrase, casually spoken, now symbolizes a group of powerful millionaires and billionaires in the public imagination. At the center of this unclear idea are powerful individuals. It's like a modern day aristocracy headquartered in this idyllic town of Stellenbosch. Johann Rupert, South Africa's wealthiest man, and Christo Wesi, among others, are the faces that come to mind when the word Stellenbosch Mafia is uttered. Allegedly, these individuals control an entire country from their base in Stellenbosch. A food retailer, ShopRite, controls the prices of basic goods. A trading company, PAP, influences what clothes you wear. And Mediclinic, a private hospital group, decides who receives medical attention. The super rich owners of these companies through their economic clout influence behavior not only in society but also in politics as they are able to call upon the powerful and connected and make demands ordinary South Africans cannot or so the theory goes. Yet many doubt that this mysterious group even exists. You see the term Stellenbosch Mafia is not necessarily an officially recognized title. 
It may be easy to simply dismiss it as just a weak conspiracy theory and a bunch of BS, but there is an undeniable connection between the affluent figures who reside in this small town. Stellenbosch is home to some of the most influential people in this country, including those connected to Rupert's Remgo and Ren Merchant Bank. The influential have built a stronghold in this perfect town. Ferreira, chairperson of Rent Merchant Investments, Michael Jordan, the former CEO of First National Bank, and Paul Harris, the ex-executive of First Rand, all live in this lovely town of Stellenbosch. Even beyond the Rand Merchant Empire, the roots of banking giant Capitec trace back to this town. Envisioned by the trio of Michel Leroux, Ryan Stanson, and Jenny Martin, the founder of the PSG Group, whose financial prowess has left a lasting mark on Stellenbosch. Mediclinic, the nation's premier private hospital group, founded by Herzog with Rembrandt Seed Capital, Barson, the retail magnate producing wine on his estate while overseeing ShopRite's dominion, and Wesi, the Pepco patriarch with a lasting connection to the town, all have their roots in Stellenbosch. Interesting, right? But that's not the end of it. Kuz Becker, chairman of Nespers, Juste with his stain of compatriots paint a complete picture with a blend of family and academic connections. This town has become the focal point of their economic influence. Uh, okay, just a bunch of rich folks living in the same town. I mean, so what? There's probably nothing to see here, right? But wait, the enormity of the companies under the stewardship of these Stellenbosch elites is nothing short of staggering. Between them, they hold major stakes in 16 of Johannesburg Stock Exchange's top 100 companies, a financial kingdom encompassing sectors from media, technology to banking, healthcare, finance, consumables, and retail. Nespers, led by Becker, reigns supreme with a market capitalization exceeding 1.5 trillion rands, while Rupert's Richmond sits at number 6 boasting 607 billion rands. First Rand, born from Rupert's financial legacy, commands 385 billion rands. And ShopRite follows at number 18 with 130 billion rands. Remgo and Rand Merchant Bank holding secure positions 22 and 23, with 108 billion rands and 106 billion rands, respectively. Capitec, Herzog's Mediclinic and Stain of Africa retail star, also make formidable appearances, totaling billions in market capitalization. The interconnectedness of these business magnates goes beyond shared stakes. They sit on each other's boards, commenting relationships that fill conspiracy theories. Well, there is denial of any existence of such a thing as the mafia, of course. Johann Rupert, for instance, detests being called part of the Stellenbosch mafia. I've never been a member of a secret organization. And I get concerned about the necessity of secrecy. But I mean, you can't tell me that all these rich individuals living in the same town don't meet and discuss business deals over wine glasses. Come on, look at all of this. You see, this whole thing, this whole hate for the rich, okay, hate is a strong word, this distaste against the rich isn't a new thing. But for South Africa, it's somewhat of a distinct case and to some extent a uh, political rhetoric. Perhaps to understand this prejudice against the Africana elite, we'd have to take the clock back to the 20th century. The year is 1948, apartheid South Africa. During this time, the government implemented policies that systematically marginalized the majority black population in favor of the white minority. The economy was shaped by discriminatory laws that limited black people's access to resources, job opportunities, and education. It's a story we all know. It has been recited multiple times. This resulted in the concentration of economic power among white-owned businesses, which was later referred to as white monopoly capital. Now, the alleged mafiosi, all white and mainly Africana, draw a connection to the economic disadvantages of apartheid. This narrative suggests that their continued prosperity seemingly ill-gotten raises questions about how they've not only maintained but multiplied their wealth. Now, fast forward to the 21st century and some have branded many prominent white businessmen like the Ruperts 
who grew their corporate empires from seeds of Africana capital as land-grabbing thieves and agents of Western imperialism who have exploited the black majority for generations. You see, South Africa, despite being an upper-middle-income country, grapples with extreme inequality. Economic statistics like those highlighted by the World Bank report in March 2018 expose the deep crisis of economic and social development. Unemployment rates in the 30 to 40 percent range, a widening wealth gap, and alarmingly high poverty rates make South Africa the most unequal country globally. All right, it's 2018, and Johan Rupert has had enough of being labeled the head of the so called mafia. So, what does he do? He decides to face the music and takes on an interview on Power FM. The air was tense, expectations high, and the aftermath. Well, let's just say it was like a social media storm meets historical re-evaluation. The interview didn't go exactly as planned. During the interview, Rupert's lack of social, political, and historical awareness became evident. His condescending tone and views on entrepreneurship got lost in the noise. The controversial remarks Rupert's comments on Afrikaners who survived concentration camps during the Anglo-Boer War, their drive and thriftiness stirred the pot. His remark about today's youth not producing potential leaders and his assertion that he hadn't seen Steve Biko at a taboo for the social media fire. Twitter went crazy. People expressed their displeasure, frustration and in some cases downright anger. The comment section resembled a battlefield of opinions, hashtags, and memes, the arsenal of the digital age. But you know how it is with contentious debates in South Africa. There's often a grain of truth amid the chaos. Rupert's words, regardless of his intentions, fell on ears tuned to the historical dissonance of wealth creation in a society marked by deep racial and economic inequalities. It's so easy to criticize the wealthy. I mean, they get one word wrong and it all goes south. The left has made the 1% a target of sustained moral and political criticism. But what exactly is wrong with the wealthy? Some argue that the wealthy could pay more taxes. Others object to the very existence of large fortunes. Perhaps more troubling is the claim that the rich create social costs for the polity by wielding disproportionate influence in the political space. Harvard philosopher T. M. Scanlon identifies the political effects of wealth inequality as one of its most consequential costs. The uncomfortable truth is that South Africa operates in what can be described as an oligarchic society where a small number of incredibly wealthy billionaires own and control a significant part of the economy. Maybe we should begin with the problem of defining how much influence is too much. Perhaps the wealthy have more informed perspectives on certain issues than the average voter and push for policies that benefit not only themselves but others too. I mean, I would rather take Rupert's advice than listen to the Nyaope guy on 7th Street Avenue. Sure, his wealth has an apathetic background of disproportionate racial advantage, but I mean, give the man some credit. He is a business mogul. So, how much influence is too much, really? In the aftermath of the Fireblade Court ruling, where former minister Malusi Gigaba faced accusations of perjury, the news of a super-rich family, the Oppenheimers, seeking a private international terminal reverberated across the nation. The courts found Gigaba guilty of lying under oath. The case laid bare the audacity of the affluent seeking a luxury bypass questioning the role of government resources in serving elite endeavors. As an ordinary South African, this probably would have made you wonder about the boundaries of privilege. I mean, the rich obviously have a lot more power than the ordinary masses, but how much influence is too much, right? In the wake of the stain of scandal, the narrative of the Stellenbosch Mafia shifted. Accusations of corruption, greed, and criminality cracked open the carefully crafted facade of the Stellenbosch elite. 
Jen Masangu, Kosatu's coordinator for pension funds, declared it corruption at its worst, staining not only corporate South Africa but particularly impacting Stellenbosch and the so-called Stellenbosch Mafia. Malema, the populist of the EFF, has probably been one of the most vocal proponents of the notion of a Stellenbosch Mafia attacking white capital and regularly invoking the Rupert name as a catch-all for everything capitalist. His criticism of the mafia and almost exclusively of Rupert is largely unsophisticated however. He ventures deeply into territory reserved for conspiracy theorists and race baiters and often makes sweeping statements and grand accusations without offering much evidence of his claims. You know, at the end of the day, this whole Stellenbosch mafia thing lacks concrete evidence and heavily relies on speculation. It's a conspiracy theory. The term itself is not officially recognized and there's no clear evidence demonstrating a coordinated effort by a wealthy elite to control the country. I mean, it's true that individuals in Stellenbosch may be interconnected through business and social networks which is totally normal. I mean, if you were rich, you'd probably hang around your rich friends, right? Business leaders often collaborate and share interests without necessarily constituting a secret society. Well, whether a formal structure with a clear agenda exists or not, there's no denying that wealth is power. And these men and women are powerful and inherently carry a lot of influence. This is the first part of a two-part series. In the next episode, we discuss the BEE millionaires. Thank you for tuning in. Remember to subscribe, like, and comment if you may. <laughs> See you next time.